I realize that I'm the only the humanist scholar in this table. It's difficult for any humanist scholar to to speak together with the social scientists, that they give you all the well-done models that I, obviously I have no such models. <laughs> At the same time, we know that uh, there was a debate uh, among the Chinese intellectuals about the, uh, whether or not there was a models. As a humanist scholar, I used to focus on the uh, like, uh, historical events and its sequence or the consequence, intended or unintended. The two days ago that the Professor McFarqua used the dialectic terms by Mao Zedong that the Huai Shi Bian Hao Shi Hao Shi Bian Huai Shi. This is a very dialectic way to think about the why the China had achieved its economic growth. And together with the problems and the crisis, that I try to uh, uh, say something. I, I, I'm sorry that I forgot to bring my glass, so I hope I, bec not because of the confuse, <laughs> confuse you for. <laughs> so in discussing the uh, Chinese model, many scholars are in the habit of comparing Chinese development to the distinct integration of the Soviet and the Eastern European system, emphasizing China's stability. Uh, while forgetting conveniently that the general crisis that broke out in 1989 began China. So its traces can still be found in different spheres in China today. The, uh, the, but the real prob the question is that why did China not collapse along with the other communist party late? the socialist countries in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe? What factors helped to maintain China's stability and create the conditions for rapid growth? So having undergone 30 years of reform, how have these conditions now been transformed? And this is the first question to which we must respond. The, uh, the, this is, a, I think, is a, in order to, to talk about the new model of the, uh, the last 30 years. The first question, we go back to the 1989. Otherwise, without the divergence between China and the Soviet, Soviet East, East Bloc, it's difficult to define China as a new so-called model of the Chinese road and so on and so forth. The, uh, um, the one of the... Uh, issue we, we, we talk actually on the lunch table is that the, the China, the, what's the main difference pre-reform pre era was China underwent the long process of the Cultural Revolution. It's a broken, certain broken of the uh, state structure and the party structure. And that was different from the other socialist countries. So one of the uh, un unexpected consequences was that the state was better able to respond to the needs of the lower strata of society, which was a, a significant difference from the rigid bu bureaucratic systems of the Soviet and Eastern European countries, when those uh, the, 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 the officials from different ranks go back, went, went back to their positions after the, uh, after the Cultural Revolution. So they are much better responded to the demands from the lower strata. So that's the beginning of the reform, why the, they achieved the legitimation of the reform, welcomed by the nation. That, that I think, is one of the, uh, the uh, difference. But mainly, I think that another difference is that the, the, uh, why the 1989 was so different for, for China. Is that the, uh, I read some memoirs by, the, by those former communist leaders in the uh, Eastern European countries. For example, in the Eastern Germany, the last secretary, the party secretary, Egon Krenz, he explained why the Eastern Germany collapsed so suddenly. And he used the term, he said that the, in the 70s, most of the, Western, the leaders from Western countries argued that the, uh, the, uh, they used the term of Bernard Genève doctrine which means that in complete sovereignty to describe the nature of the state of the Eastern European countries. He said that once that a change happened in, in, within the Soviet Union, that the consequence will be happened in these Eastern European countries. So the collapse the following that. In that case, the post-war structure, the world structure, were, were, were used to define as a sovereign, sovereign state system, but actually it's a very few countries have the real independence or the sovereignty. 
in that sense, because both the East Bloc and the West Bloc was not are all the incomplete sovereignty, uh, sovereign countries. But China, look, go back to the China, Chinese situation. The, we know that the, after the 1949, uh, the, the Korean War, Chinese break with the uh, Western countries, especially with America. But in the first five plan years that the Chinese, Chinese economy and the, the whole social structure was highly dependent on the support from the Soviet Union. But after the late 50s, we know that there were serious debates between the Chinese Communist Party and the Soviet Union. So that the most difficult, the most tough period from Great Leap Forward, uh, the period to the early the, uh, uh, 60s. But that the intended consequence was that made the Chinese sovereignty or the, the much more self-reliance and much more independent, which was really different from Eastern European countries. So that without that, that the self-reliance and the, that kind of the more complete sovereignty, it's difficult to explain why China didn't collapse after the uh, 1989, following that, that the Soviet uh, other socialist countries. So that the, uh, that the political nature of the self-reliance policy, well, there was obviously there was a massive or the uh, uh, significant consequence in the economic, uh, social, culture, and uh, so on and so forth. So that the, made the Chinese economy much more independent national economy compared to any other the, the issues. And also, in order to search for that independence, the Chinese the foreign policy was changed following that. Because without that, it's difficult to understand the reconciliation between China and America in the early 70s. So that, that's, the, uh, that's the talking about the so-called opening policy, was can be traced back to that period rather than only post-cultural revolution. Because without the debates or in the brick, brick with the, the, the conflicts, with the confrontation with the Soviet Union, it's difficult to understand the reconciliation between China and America. So in that way, the people used to say that the open policy or the closed door policy, but actually you can see that the continuity uh, from there in, 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 in a way of the, the, the discontinuity in the sense of the continuity. You know, this is a kind of the, the, the dialectical relationship between the continuity and the discontinuity. So that created a new historical situation for the Chinese reform. I think without that, the international situation change was quite uh, difficult for that to understand the, uh, the, the, the Chinese reform in the last 30 years. So this is, a, uh, uh, I think it's a, uh, in that way, the Chinese reform different from Many other uh, the, the socialist countries, maybe it's much more autonomous. It's an internal logic from within that uh, launched the reform. It's not uh, only under the, the, the pressure from outside, but try, there was certain kind of, of the historical logic for search for the new road. So this is, a, a, the, the, I think, it's a quite a important. And the second aspect from there, it's, a, uh, uh, it's about the... Uh, political system. All these debates and even the state sovereignty issue was started from, not from the nominal, like a social scientist used to, to describe that the sovereignty in the international relations, but go back to the political relations between the political parties. So all the reform and the international relations started from the, the, uh, the party's policy and its orientation. Without that, so in, in that sense, it's difficult not to mention the nature of the CCP in order to understand the contemporary on the 20th century Chinese history. So that I think it's a, uh, the, the one of the aspect, uh, the issue. If we, if we want to understand that the, the, uh, the, the CCP's role in the uh, Chinese revolution and the Chinese reform, I think it's a uh, go back uh, very briefly mentioned that the Chinese Revolution, because it's, uh, otherwise it's difficult. The Chinese Revolution and the reform occurred within the traditional agricultural society in which the farmer became the revolutionary subject, whether in the early stages of the revolution or war, or during the era of the social reconstruction and the reform, the sacrifice and the contributions of the agriculture class were always significant. Their expressions of the active spirit and the creativity leaving a profound impression on people's minds. Because in the long revolution and the wars, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the party system 
was rooted, integrated into the whole uh, society, the networks in the in the in the lower, much lower uh, uh, levels. So penetrated into the whole society, which it seemed that the different from the uh, rigid bureaucratic system in the, some other countries. So that's why the uh, the whole the, the capacity for the social mobilization was much stronger than any other the party system that uh, especially the in, in the Soviet Union and the Eastern uh, European countries. Without the uh, the uh, long Chinese Revolution, it's difficult to understand that the political nature of that uh, the, the system. At the same time, because of these, uh, there were uh, double uh, 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 demands of that. Because of the rural society, on the one hand, there was a long tradition, because the Chinese the society has a long tradition of the, uh, the certain kind of the market the mechanism can trace back to the much earlier history. But on the other hand, uh, through the whole 20th century, the land relations radically changed. Without that change, it's difficult to, to understand that the, the redistribution of land in the early years of the reform was so welcome, and that which was the foundation for the success of the first stage of the uh, Chinese reform in, in, in that period. So that, I think, it's at the same time, the, uh, because of these, uh, the, the political process, that the, the Chinese, uh, the, uh, uh, the position of the state, to some extent, is also uh, different from many other countries. The uh, Professor Yao Yang, uh, from Peking University used the term of the so-called neutral government to define the role of the state and uh, when it launched the reform which were well welcomed by, 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 by the people. That the so-called neutral means that they neutralized from the special interest groups. But that, that kind of the state in that certain period is that the neutralization of the state was not the, 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 the result of the neutralization, obviously, is a long political process, is the uh, result of the Chinese, long Chinese revolution. Without that, the, the, uh, it's difficult to understand that the state c could be neutralized from that the special interest groups. It really depends on the social structure. So that, I think, it's a quite important uh, the ele element or the precondition for the, uh, the, the, the success of the Chinese reef, or the, at, at least uh, the, the economic growth. But now the some question is that all these preconditions now is in shifting or the, in, in the uh, transformation. For example, the, because of the marketization, globalization, the sovereignty issue was obviously it's changed, transformed. It's not possible to follow the older way to talk about these, the, the, the sovereignty. This is the one aspect. The second is that the role of the party, I think it's a cha transformed very much because my understanding is that now the Communist Party is different from the party in the 20th century because in the 20th century, which was a very much strong political organization, but now the political, the, the Chinese Communist Party, in in to a great great extent, integrated into the function of the state framework. Okay, so in that way, it's uh, it seems that because the uh, that that because the state, it's uh, launched the reform and uh, worked. It's, it's really integrated into the market activities, no more neutralized. Only the political organization can search that uh, certain kind of the neutral role of that. That's why the, uh, the party more and more integrated into the state. For example, the discipline system, anti-corruption system, and so on and so forth were there. But, but, but eventually, what kind of the, uh, the, the, uh, the new political orientation and the direction was still uncertain. It's need to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to think about that. So I think there were, I, the, the conclusion. I think there were at least three aspects we need to consider. The first, China experienced a long and a profound revolution in 20th century so that Chinese society retains an acute sensitivity towards the demands of the fairness and the social equality. How should these historical and the political traditions be translated into the democratic demands under the contemporary conditions? I mean, I use democratic demands not necessarily means that, uh, well, it's, it's a well done model because now the everywhere we need to search for the real democratic, uh, the, 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 the models because the, the universal crisis of that. 
Second, the Chinese Communist Party is massive and ha has experienced significant change, becoming more entangled with the state apparatus with each day. How can this party system become more uh, the democratic and how can that the, the uh, can the state's ability to represent the universal interest be preserved while the role of the party is being transformed? Third, how can a new political form be constructed upon the social base, granting a greater political capacity to mass society and thereby overcoming the condition of the uh, depoliticization created through the new liberal uh, marketization? These questions have great important the theoretical questions, including on the conditions of globalization and marketization, in what political direction will the people of, the, of China move towards? How can a self-reliant Chinese society be forged as China is opening up? The global significance of this exploration should be obvious, given the universal crisis of the market and the democracy in the worldwide. Thank you.